Today's reading is by Simon Sink. Cynic, sorry. Start with why. We are drawn to organizations that are good at communicating what they believe, their ability to make us feel like we belong, to make us feel special, safe, and not alone <coughs> is part of what gives them the ability to inspire us. We know we belong together because we can feel it in our gut. If you'll take these words into the silence for a few moments, please. God is right here, right now, in this beautiful morning with the bright shining sun. God is in the light breeze, communicating to us love and happiness and all the blessed things that we have in this life. And we are part of this blessing. We are part of this gift. We are part of everything that is transpiring right here, right now. I am thankful for this community where we do feel special, safe, and not alone, and part of God. I am thankful for the ministries here, for the music ministry, for the children's ministry, and everything that goes on here this day and all through the week. I am thankful, and I say, and so it is. <laughs> I sure hope my batteries don't run down. I didn't change them. We'll see. So I told you last week I was in um, somewhere in Temecula. Thank you. <laughs> I get those, you know, there's town after town after town, and I had to drive through about 15 of them between Encinitas, which is where I was staying, and 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 uh, Temecula. Um, a friend of mine is the minister there, one of my classmates from Holmes Institute, and uh, it was only 100 degrees there. It was really hot. Um, and it's always really interesting to speak in other places because um, I just get a different viewpoint, you know, a different feel, a different um, way of doing things, some of which I find very compelling and some of which makes me happy that I'm right here with y'all. <laughs> but it was really nice, um, and then I went, and then Sunday afternoon I went to the Holmes Institute, well, it's, it's now called the Centers for Spiritual Living School of Spiritual Leadership, it's our ministerial training program. Two women that I've mentored through their ministerial training were graduating, and so it was really wonderful to be there for that. And then I came back and sneaked off to Hocking Hills for some quiet, it was wonderful. Um, and thank you, Lana, for speaking. Everyone said it was fabulous, so thank you. So my topic last week in Temecula was, was what is your why? And, and I want to sort of continue that with us today, but I want to ask us what is our why? Why do we exist as a spiritual community? What do we stand for? What's our reason for being? Why have we been here for 70 years and... Why do we plan to be here for 70 more? What is our, what is it we want to live from in a larger, more expansive, more focused, and more fulfilling way? And how does living from our why fulfill our monthly theme, which is freedom from discord? There's a quote by Ernest Holmes that every time I read it, it sort of just blows me away. Our founder, Ernest Holmes, wrote, I believe the ultimate goal of life to be a complete emancipation from all discord of every nature, and that this goal is sure to be attained by all. 
that's a big deal. <laughs> that's like enormous. It kind of makes you say, well, I wonder, there you are. I was looking for you, hiding in the corner over there. Our, our traveling practitioner, nice to see you, Michelle. Anyway, my point is that that is a huge, huge thing. And how do we even start with that? We start like we start everywhere else. We start within ourselves, right? We start right here, figuring out what my, where, where do I get into discord? Where do we get into discord? How do we emancipate ourselves from all discord? And then how do we help the world, help other people in the world emancipate themselves from discord? So figuring out our collective why, I think, is a really good place to start. The, the, the quote today comes from a book I've been reading, uh, Simon Sinek, Start With Why. And in the book, he distinguishes people who and organizations who are clear on their why from those who aren't. And one of the people that he talks about is Dr. Martin Luther King. He was clear on why he was. Another couple were the Wright brothers. You know, this, you know, you all know the story because they were from here, right? There was another guy who was in, in the race, quote unquote, to build the first airplane and he had government backing and corporate backing and lots of money and lots of help. And the Wright brothers knew why they existed. <clears throat> they knew that their vision was we are going to fly. Their father was a minister and he said, you're doing the devil's work. If you keep this, if God had wanted you to fly, he'd have... Giving you wings. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Yet they knew, they knew it was possible. It was their vision, it was their burning des desire, it was their why, and they won the race. The other guy has sort of, I don't even remember his name, sort of faded off into the, into the nothingness. He crashed into the river. There you go. <laughs> Corporations that Cynic mentions are Disney and Apple. You know, Apple Computer is not the largest computer supplier, but it's very influential. And their why is always to challenge the status quo, which is why we all walk around with cool little smart touch, touch screen t uh, phones and iPods this big that will hold, you know, our lifetime's worth of music and stuff like that. So, how do you figure out what your why is? And what our why is? Most of the time in our world, in our relationships, in our jobs, in everything we do, we work from the outside in. We go from what to how and only sometimes get to the why. Um, I know that because I was a lawyer for a lot of years before I said, this is not my why. This is not where I am supposed to be. But I had done it because. <laughs> Who knows why? Who knows why? I just knew it was not my why. So, you know, I, I was thinking about this particularly for last week, and, and I realized that our individual why is at the intersection of three things our burning desire, the thing that lights us on fire, the fire from heaven, what we do well, and what the world needs. And if we find the place all three of those circles cross, we are in the sweet spot. We are in our magic place. We are in our why. When I thought about that why of this community, and we've done a lot of work on this already, I thought it's a little bit more complicated. Why do people gather here on Sunday morning? Why do some of them stay in mother lawns like today? Why do, um, why do, why have we been gathering for 70 years? Why do we come together to, to be together and, and to study these universal principles that we teach. We have vision and mission statements. Our vision is awakening to the spiritual magnificence of ourselves and our planet. And our mission is we are an inclusive community grounded in love, transforming the planet by transforming ourselves through changed minds and spiritual practices. We stand boldly uh, living joyful, balanced lives, practicing love in every moment really good descriptors of who we are, but I'm not sure they answer the question. What is our why? What short statement 
would you make as to why this community exists? I want you to think about that because pretty soon I'm going to come down with a microphone and ask you to tell me. What short statement would you offer as to what our why is as a community? One, one that came to my mind was to teach the spiritual principles we teach. That there is only one life and we're all part of it. It's that thing we call God. That every one of us is an embodiment of that life. We teach spiritual practices, meditation, visioning, af affirmation, spiritual mind treatment, prayer. We teach those things. We teach responsibility for ourselves, meaning that we understand we always can change our response to conditions no matter what. That, that we choose the way that we not react, because reaction sometimes comes before response, but that we're able to choose how we wish to respond to the events of the day that we can choose always to respond in forgiveness and love, and that we can change our stream of thought when it gets weird. <laughs> we can change our stream of thought to something more productive. So there's some more descriptors, but what is our why? Who's ready? Somebody must have an idea. Oh, merely. As long as we're not right in front of the mic. That we are... To, to reveal the truth that we are all one in the um, divine perfection. I know you all have things to say. <laughs> um, that we've been a spiritual community for seven years. I think it is because we are here to anchor that, that energy of spirit of the divine and that we, we feel that and that's why we're here. I think we're a, um, a shining light in the community, and people, um, when they come here, feel like they're at home, and that's really important. It is really important, isn't it? Did you have something? Dan. <laughs> and maybe we're here to help each other get out of whatever box we're in. Yeah. Amen. Amen. I think that we come together here with our differences, our different cultural backgrounds, our different environments, um, our different experiences, to find a greater purpose within ourselves and to share that purpose with the people in our lives and to make a difference. Amen. I mean, I'm getting there. <laughs> I just like what's on the bulletin to promote a world that works for everyone. Yes, Marge. Well, I think my why is uh, this is a place to serve and to be supported in my highest vision of truth. I'm here because you are here. My fear keeps getting larger the longer I come here. I love this mic. <laughs> to live what we teach. <laughs> to be the light and love that I am for you. To become intimate with the divine. Did he want to say something? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you here? Uh, and that's in America. Yes. That is a good reason. <laughs> Thank you. Linda. To hold a high watch for the world. To hold the high watch for the world, to make a difference, to love each other, to help each other remember who we are, to help support each other in that ain't easy part. 
in living our philosophy because it isn't easy. Sometimes it's very difficult. Yes, dear? Last call? Mine is to infuse our minds with the knowledge and strength to shine the light of enlightenment where darkness <coughs> seeks to reign. Yes. So that we can take our collective lights, we can be in our collective lights, which brightens our own light, and so that we can take our own light out into the world and help other people realize how bright they shine, right? That's a big part of it right there. Um, it's all about practicing what we teach, right? It's not about just hearing it or being able to say it. It's really all of these things that we've discussed happen when we put our principles and values into practice, especially when it ain't easy, especially when there are things that happen out there that might spur us to an unprincipled reaction. A couple of things have come up lately that really, excuse me, that have really made me think about this. Let's start with the hard, the easy one. Y'all heard about Harambe, right? The gorilla at the Cincinnati Zoo that was killed. I saw some responses, reactions that were very interesting. Why'd they kill that gorilla? Why'd they have to kill the gorilla? Um, the best one was, where were the parents? Why aren't they in jail? Then there was, what is the matter with the people in the charge of that zoo? Etc. 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 Here's the thing. Every one of those responses was outrage. Right? And outrage comes from, oh, what do you call it? Um, Self-righteousness, I guess I'd say. I hate to be blunt, but it's true, isn't it? I mean, my first response was, damn it, the gorilla always gets it. It's always the animal who suffers. And, and, and then I had to stop and realize that I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. I do know that people were making a lot of noise and the gorilla was getting spooked. And, and I also know that every parent here, every human being here, which means all of us, has been careless from time to time. Maybe we didn't have a kid in our charge, but we've been careless. We've hit somebody's car, or maybe hit somebody, maybe worse. We've dropped something down a drain. We've, maybe we have lost a child. You know, you know, they disappear that fast, and you don't know where they are, and then you have to go and track them down. I know that the people in the gorilla, in the, the gorilla people, the zoo employees, didn't want to kill that gorilla. They wanted it to thrive. I know that I wasn't there, and that, and that, and that outrage is seems 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 to be our national pastime. <laughs> I think our media whips us into it, and it seems to be our national pastime. And it is so. Um, it's based in in I don't know what. I think it's fueled by me, the media, but it's also fueled by the stress of living and by our isolation from one another. The first place our mind goes is to sensationalism rather than, oh, God, I feel such compassion for everybody there, for the parents, for the little kid who was probably scared, for the people who had to kill the gorilla, for the gorilla, for everybody concerned. Why is our first response not compassion? First of all, for ourselves when we react in outrage. We have to have compassion for ourselves, too. We're part of this, this nation which seems to go to outrage first. The, the greater call is compassion. The greater call is compassion for everybody concerned. And then there's this awful, awful thing that happened last night in Orlando where someone with an assault rifle apparently walked into a club frequented by gays and lesbians and and um, opened fire and killed 20 people. And, and again, my reaction is outrage. My reaction is anger. 
And my response, the call for my response is for compassion. The call for my response is for a bigger way to view the thing. I'm not saying compassion as let's lie down and roll over and just let stuff happen. No, no, no. I'm saying when we respond from a place of compassion, then the action we take has some likelihood of being successful. When we react in outrage, we just further stir the pot. We just make other people more and more and more angry. If you, you know, that harambe, the comments on Facebook and stuff were simply that. It was, I'm more outraged than you and you're a fool. No, I'm more outraged than you and I'm right and you're wrong. They just escalated and escalated and escalated. Whereas if we stop and, and think about the fact that the shadow in our country, our communal societal shadow is very visible at the moment. It's very visible. How can we have compassion for those who feel, who, who are working from within that shadow part of us and they don't even know it? They don't even know what's driving them. How can we have compassion for the people who died, who lost their lives and the people around them? How can we have compassion for the people who were there thinking they might very well lose their lives, their human lives. How can we have compassion for a system that lets stuff like this happen? And then how can we, as a compassionate community, respond in such a way we start to affect change? Because the world that works for everyone, for all life, in my view, doesn't include anybody walking into a club with an assault rifle and killing 20 people. That's not part of it. I think that's true for all of us, isn't it? <laughs> it's also not a place where, you know, I mean, sometimes things that ha like ha what happened at the zoo will happen, but it's a place where we think about all the players beforehand so that it's safe for gorillas and children. The great call for us as a community, I think, is to live what we say, we believe, to live what we teach, to remember that everyone, everyone, no matter what, is an embodiment, a part of this oneness that we call God. It is to, to check our responses that come out of outrage or self-righteousness. It is to remember that when somebody says something that we might take personally, that we don't have to. We don't have to take it personally. We can stop and say, what's really going on here and what's going on in me? This is the place we turn reaction to response. Not out there, but in here. When we're called instead, what we're called to do instead is to breathe and say, how do I wish to respond? Not react, but how do I wish to respond? When we have questions about why people do things the way they do, maybe we could ask for more information instead of make up our own facts, which I saw an enormous amount of with Harambe. People were making up stories without the facts. When we want to change something in our world, the very first call to us is to change ourselves first. And then, to bring forward the idea for change into the community and let the community support it as well if it's to be supported. When we're feeling fearful, the call is to lean into our faith, the faith that tells us that God is always with us, within us, supporting us, guiding us, all around us, and everybody else too, everybody else too. Part of it is to um, remember that when the world out there seems crazy, instead of reacting in fear, take a breath and figure out how to respond in love and compassion and creativity and generosity and to lean into what we teach here, to, to participate in the community, to be supported in switching reaction to response, to come to service, to take classes, to create and maintain a spiritual practice that feeds you and that, it, and that quiets the fear, to learn how to pay attention to our thoughts and change their direction when they go off 
crazy. Because they do. It ain't easy, as Carol said. All these things are part of our why, as a community, I think. They're the building blocks on which we stand so that when issues arise in the community or outside the community, we respond with awareness, with open-heartedness, with compassion rather than with blame or confrontation or hurt. The call of our why is to live our philosophy. The call of our why is to individually and collectively really truly get it down into our bones that God is all there is, that we're part of it, and that we have the responsibility for our experience of life. And collectively that means we try to make spiritual practice of some, part, some nature part of everything we do, whether it's a team meeting or a board meeting or a Sunday service or whatever it is. It's, it means that we do all that we can do to make new people feel welcome because we want as many people as we can reach to receive whatever's here for them to help them awaken to their spiritual magnificence. It includes being very good stewards of our money and property. And I, I want to give you a real quick view into that because some people don't know. Um, every time we receive an offering here, two people count it. N never one person alone. Two people count it. And then after that, a person counts it in preparing a deposit recap sheet for the bookkeeper. And if those two don't tally, we find out why not and then they prepare a deposit, and then later the bookkeeper, who's not here, has no access to our funds or our cash flow at all, again checks that with the bank. So there's three different points we can make sure that what went in the basket is what also goes in the bank. We have a, a treasurer, Linda Andriaco, and she and I look over the financial reports every month before the whole board looks over the financial reports. We have lots and lots and lots of checks and balances to make our stewardship of money the best it can be. We have a, 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 they're called the FIT team, Facilities Improvement Team, who takes care of our building to try to make it and care for it the very best we can. Um, we try to come to everything we do that way. We have a system of shared leadership so that anyone who wants to have a say in the way things happen here is invited into leadership of a team or a group and once a month we all get together to share with each other what's going on and how we can be better leaders. We try to do many, many things to, um, to really follow our philosophy, which is trust God and take responsibility. That's about it in a nutshell, right? Trust God and take responsibility. Um, that is part of the call of our why. It's to remember that when things get weird, we have a faith that we can lean into no matter what. To remember that where God is, all things are possible. And that where God is, which is right here, we can never be unsupported and alone. We have... Um, we have a strong call in this community, I think, to so live our principles that we illuminate our own lives to the degree that people as they say in AA, want what we have. That's it. That's it right there, right? When you say that about someone in AA, it means they understand themselves and their sobriety so much that you want that. And the same thing is true here. We want to be so compassionate and so loving and so clear and so filled with faith that people say, ooh, that looks good on you. I want some too, right? And the way that we do that is to really, truly embody the principles we teach. Really, truly embody them. So it, it, I try to summarize our why. It's to teach, learn, and practice our philosophy, both individually and collectively. And sometimes that means we have to ask somebody and listen when they say you're not really doing that. right? And that means individually and collectively. And when I'm not doing it, I want someone to say, 